Well, good morning, Gladstone Christian Fellowship Church family. Uh, we're here uh, in Gladstone Christian Fellowship Church, uh, just with uh, a few people uh, on a Saturday afternoon, uh, uh, videotaping this message for uh, so it's ready for Sunday morning. So uh, this uh, Sunday is Mother's Day, and uh, we encourage you to uh, celebrate Mother's Day and and. Uh, give a, a shout out to any of those mothers who've affected your life, probably your own mother. I uh, just got a few announcements before we uh, proceed and uh, one is, I guess this coming week, uh, is a ministerial meeting at 8 o'clock on Tuesday. Uh, prior to that meeting is a prayer meeting at 7 o'clock and there's also another morning prayer meeting at uh, 7 o'clock on Thursday morning, that's May the 14th. And on Wednesday, May the 13th, 7 in the evening, it's worship team practice. I just have a, a really important announcement in regard to uh, Pastor Randy's um, vote. Uh, here the church council had distributed ballots and begun a voting process regarding this. However, it was interrupted by the postponement of our services. That ballot is now being discarded and the voting process will be redone. I assume that's because a lot of people had lost their ballots or put them in a safe place and couldn't remember where they were. And, and so there was uh, some, some uh, challenges that way. And so the council has decided to have a, uh, uh, an election or vote process by walking in. So. To cast a ballot regarding this, you will need to go to one of two voting locations. This is for members of our congregation, uh, either on May 27th from 6 to 9 p.m. or Sunday, May 31st from noon to 8 p.m. And one of those places will be right here at the church. And for those who live in the Austin McGregor area, the other place during those times will be James Zacharias's shop in Austin on those dates and times. Uh, so if you have any questions about that, uh, just give uh, James Zacharias a call. I have another announcement, and I should have mentioned it last week, and it's kind of funny. I, I was at this young fellow's birthday party, and I forgot to mention that Seth Weeb, uh, I guess it's a week and a half ago or so, turned 18 years old, and so we wish Seth happy birthday in regard to that. We're going to look at our missionary of the week. <clears throat> it is Daryl and Karen Friesen with Wycliffe uh, Bible Translators with the Thailand Foundation. I'll just read their thing. We are seeking to see the Thai church become the champion for missions in Southeast Asia. In 2019 alone, more than 1,050 Thai people participated in missions training and outreach events. Eight new Thai churches are supporting Thai missionaries. Seven Thai workers completed their training and are being released for field service. Pray for them. And also a prayer item for the Friesens is that Karen, in this month, will be having her last major surgery for cancer. And if everything goes well in September, they want to return to Thailand. So pray for them. In regard, it's not in your bulletins, but uh, I have another, just a, a prayer item for missionaries. And this past week, got an email from Merrill and Teresa Dick. And uh, Merrill's had cornea transplant surgery. And so I uh, just pray that his, uh, his, that will take and that he'll be able to see out of that eye. But even a more major concern is that the people group in South America that they've been working with for many, many years have planted a church there. There's been some trouble down there, and uh, some real serious trouble. And uh, four of those uh, national people got shot by, uh, by ranchers while they were working in their gardens. And some of these people were friends of Merrill and Teresa Dick. They were, they were believers, our brothers and sisters in Christ. So pray for, for the Dicks and uh, the, the people group that they ministered to for, for many, many years in the, in the, the terrible situation in, in that one village. Also, we need to be in prayer for a number of people who, from our congregation who are in hospital. Uh, take note that Peter Wolf, I think, is in Gladstone Hospital, and so is Ann Reimer. 
And also uh, Joanne Fair's uh, father, John Mouthy, has been admitted to hospital in Portage. So pray for them. It's a difficult time being in hospital with no visitors being allowed. So uh, pray for, for recovery for them all. Also pray for the leadership at the, the Bible camps, Valley View Bible Camp and Circle Square Ranch are the camps that uh, our church family supports. Also other camps, Gimli and Dauphin and Turtle Mountain and so forth. Um, as they make uh, big decisions uh, facing an uncertain summer schedule. Uh, continue to pray for Linda and Jake Friesen and their family as uh, Linda deals with very, very serious cancer. Um, and uh, continue to also pray uh, for others who are struggling with, with real health struggles, uh, real health challenges. Um, I'll continue to pray for Bill Unger as he continues treatments for his cancer. And um, one that I would, I would mention is uh, we just found out that yesterday that our daughter Alyssa has been diagnosed with uh, COVID-19. So I would ask you, and I think she would uh, appreciate your prayers for her in that regard, uh, uh, living with a couple of roommates in an apartment while she seeks to uh, reach out for Jesus to the new immigrant population of Toronto. Yeah. Well, I think that's all I have for announcements. I think I'm going to go to scripture reading right now. So if you have your Bibles with you, I would encourage you to turn to 2 Timothy uh, chapter 1. And we'll read uh, the first nine verses there. 2 Timothy chapter 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, according to the promise of life in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my beloved son, Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God whom I serve with a clear conscience the way my forefathers did, as I constantly remember you in my prayers night and day, longing to see you even as I recall your tears, so that I may be filled with joy. For I am mindful of the sincere faith within you, which first dwelt in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I am sure that it is in you as well. For this reason I remind you to kindle afresh the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God has not given us a spirit of fear or timidity, but of power and of love and of discipline. Therefore do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord or of me, his prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel according to the power of God, who saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was granted us in Christ Jesus from all eternity. So far, the reading of God's word. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the fact that our calling, our salvation is not according to our works, but it's according to your purpose and to your grace. Heavenly Father, we thank you that uh, we can be encouraged like Timothy to kindle afresh the gifts that you have given to us so that we can use them for the good of others and for the building of your kingdom, for your glory, Heavenly Father, we, we thank you that even when we are discouraged sometimes, you use your spirit through your people to bring us encouragement. Father, we thank you for giving us all mothers. Thank, Father, we thank you for, those of, for the mothers that we had who led us to you, who gave us spiritual encouragement. Father, we would pray for uh, those who are still very actively being mothers and grandmothers as they offer a certain sense of leadership to those who are their children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren. We ask your blessing upon them today in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this, this morning being, or the today being Mother's Day, I thought I would bring a, start with a few quotes from moms that I found from here and there. 
that I, I kind of found a little bit humorous, and so I'm just going to look at a few of them. First one is, if you fall out of a tree and break both your legs, don't come running to me. Uh, moms have said that to their kids. At least one mom has. And I kind of wonder, you know, how would the kid with two broken legs be able to come running to his mom? Here's another one. Shut your mouths and eat your supper. Now, I assume that was spoken by a mom whose kids were arguing or complaining to each other or whatever, and she was tired of it and told them to shut their mouths, but uh, it would be very hard to eat your supper with the mouth shut. There's another one. If you're going to kill each other, do it outside. I just finished cleaning. And I can understand that, Mom. She spent a lot of work cleaning the house, and she doesn't want it messed up with a couple of guys, a couple of, I presumably, sons wrestling and fighting with each other. Here's a few common sense ones, or ones that maybe moms have used to try to instill some common sense in their kids. Here it is. If your friend Jimmy jumped off a cliff, would you do it too? Uh, whoever the mother was talking to better be careful how he answers that one. Here's another one moms often say. I don't care who started it, I'm ending it. That's in regards to probably squabbles between siblings. Here's another one that my wife uh, told me about that she's heard. I don't think she's ever used it, but maybe she's, I don't know. She says, keep that up and I'll give you a reason to cry. Uh, I'm not sure what that was about, but you can ask my wife. Um, here's the one that's very common. Moms use it lots. Because I said so, that's why. Uh, hard to argue with that logic. Here's another one that moms use. What part of no don't you understand? I think that's a rhetorical question. I, hope, I don't think too many kids should answer to that one. And here's another one that's kind of a rhetorical question that moms use. How many times do I have to tell you da-da-da-da-da, so-and-so? Again, I think if one of their children gave them a number, they would probably be in worse trouble. And here's the last one uh, that I'm going to mention. I, I think it's kind of funny, but some might... It says, I brought you into this world and I can take you out. Uh, I've heard of one mother using that phrase, but I know the mother, and she was a very genteel, and, and she loved her children dearly. So I, I'm, I'm very sure that it was just a joke that she was, uh, you know, relaying to her children. I really think the vast majority of moms would lay down their lives for their children. That's something that God has placed in parents, especially moms, for the well-being of their children. Now, sin in the human race has tainted that motherhood protectiveness. But if you look at the vast majority of mothers that you know, I think you would agree that they not only want their kids to survive and live, but they also want them to thrive. They want them to do well in all areas of life. Today is set apart in many nations of our world to honor mothers. It's Mother's Day. The great author C.S. Lewis said it this way, he says, The homemaker has the ultimate career. All other careers exist for own, one purpose only, and that is to support this ultimate career. Women, you are the makers of homes, and homes are the foundation of society. The Bible gives us many examples of motherhood throughout history. Some were good examples, great examples, some others were horrible examples of motherhood. Uh, some were good examples in many areas, but not so good in some areas. And some mothers of great Bible characters are not even mentioned by name. But it is interesting to note that though God is referred to many, many times throughout Scripture as our Father, a Father, to those who have faith in Him, some of his attributes are best illustrated to us as people by comparing them to the attributes that we most often see in mothers. In fact, the prophet Isaiah uses the illustration of a mother's feelings and actions toward her little baby to proclaim God's faithfulness and compassion to his people Israel. We read, Shout for joy, you heavens, rejoice, you earth. Burst into song, you mountains, for the Lord comforts his people and will have compassion on his afflicted ones. But Zion said, The Lord has forsaken me. 
The Lord has forgotten me. This is how God responds. Can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion on the child she has born? Though she may forget, I will never not forget. See, I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. Your walls are ever before me. That's Isaiah chapter 49, verses 13 to 16. So even though we do hear of cases where a mother abandons or neglects her child for her own selfish reasons, those cases are not very frequent. But God is even more faithful, more compassionate than a mother of a very dependent baby. Deuteronomy chapter 32, Moses used the analogy of a mother eagle catching her eaglets, demonstrating God's care for the people of Israel. We read in verses 10 to 12, In a desert land he found him, in a barren and howling waste. He shielded him and cared for him. He guarded him as the apple of his eye, like an eagle that stirs up its nest and hovers over its young, that spreads its wings to catch them and carries them aloft. Several hundred years later, <clears throat> Jesus himself used the picture of a hen gathering her chicks under her wings, that's in Matthew 23, to give these chicks protection. He illustrated that, used that as an illustration of what he wanted to do for the people of his day. You see, Jesus desire, desired that the people of Jerusalem the people that he preached to, who he healed, who he fed, would come to him for protection, for guidance, and for provision. He desired that they would accept him as their Messiah, their Savior, and find eternal safety and eternal provision. He wanted them to accept his love for them and experience all his goodness. But the choice was theirs. And sadly, many of those living in the time of Christ chose to reject his offer. Well, God's faithfulness, God's love, God's compassion and protection are well illustrated by a mother's love and desire for her children. But as you probably have observed, being a mother who gives of herself self selflessly for her children doesn't necessarily mean she is doing the most important things for her children. You see, many moms work extremely hard sacrificing things that they have wanted in order to give their children what they thought was important. But sometimes, in reality, what they think is important or quite important, from God's perspective, from an eternal perspective, is really not that important at all. And their sacrifice, their hard work, even though well-meaning, actually took away time and energy and resources from that which was eternally important. What I'd like for us to do this morning is to take a look at the legacy of two mothers who had a positive influence on their children, considering it from an eternal perspective. These women are only mentioned briefly in two places in the New Testament, once in Acts 16 and the other in 2 Timothy. Uh, these two women were actually a mother and a daughter, and they lived in the province of Galatia, uh, which is now part of uh, the country of Turkey. And these two women may have become Christians through the testimony of people who had come to faith at Pentecost, when Jewish people from throughout the whole Mediterranean region heard the gospel of Jesus Christ, and some became believers and went back to their home region and and relayed that message of the gospel. Uh, they may have heard the gospel from Christians later on who had fled Judea because of persecution and ended up in some of the regions surrounding the Mediterranean around the Roman Empire. Or they may have come to faith in Christ through the preaching or teaching of Paul and Barnabas on their first missionary journey to that region. But regardless of whom they heard the truth of the gospel from, or when they heard it, they accepted it. And these two women, this mother and daughter, had influenced the son of the daughter, who was probably a young man in his late teens or early 20s, to accept the message of the gospel as well. And the young man I'm talking about was Timothy, 
the Apostle Paul's most faithful co-worker. He was a missionary, a church planter, and a pastor. He was also a troubleshooter for congregations who had some serious problems. In Acts 16, uh, the, gospel, the writer Luke describes Timothy's mother as a Jewish woman who was a believer, but his father was a Greek. In Paul's last letter, his second, uh, his second letter to Timothy, Paul talks about the legacy of faith that Timothy has in his grandmother and in his, no and in his mother, but he doesn't say anything about Timothy's father in regard to faith in Christ. So I believe that there is a very good chance that Timothy's dad did not share in the faith of the gospel of Jesus. In addition to this, because Timothy's mother had married a non-Jewish person, that gives evidence that she had not been practicing Orthodox Jewish faith. And so here we have young Timothy growing up in a home of mixed race, of mixed religions, in a city where the vast majority was Gentile or Greek, or worshiping false gods, practicing idolatry, practicing sexual immorality, and practicing sorcery. Because if Timothy's hometown of Lystra was anything like other towns in that region, uh, that would have been the case. We we'll see in the book of Acts, new believers in Ephesus uh, burned $4 million worth of sorcery books on the very same journey that Timothy joined to help the Apostle Paul. But Timothy comes to faith in, this, in Christ despite the probability that his father was an unbeliever. It may have been through the Apostle Paul's teaching on his first missionary journey, or Timothy may have come to faith previous to that. But this we do know if we look at verse 5 of chapter 2 of, or of 2 Timothy chapter 1, sorry, we find that it was Timothy's grandmother Lois who first came to faith in Christ. And undoubtedly, she had an influence on her daughter Eunice, who also came to a sincere faith in Christ. You see, grandmothers can have a very profound influence for God in the lives of their adult children, but also in the lives of their grandchildren, whether they be small children or teenagers or even adults. And the grace of God worked through these women of sincere faith so that in spite of all the negative influences that Timothy would have been exposed to, Timothy came to a genuine faith in Christ. Not only that, he grew in spiritual maturity to the point that the Christians in his own hometown of Lystra and in neighboring towns spoke so well of Timothy living out his faith that the Apostle Paul wanted Timothy to join his missionary team. It was probably only two or three years since the Apostle Paul had made his first stop in Lystra. So why do you think Timothy matured so fast spiritually that he stood out and was commended by the people of his own church? Well, I believe it was because Timothy's grandmother Lois and his mother Eunice had taught Timothy the truth of God's word ever since he was a boy. We need to remember that at this point in time, they would have only had the Old Testament. Most of the New Testament had not been written and circulated yet. Let's read 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 14 to 17. You, however, continue in the things that you have learned and become convinced of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the sacred writings which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. Moms and grandmas need to take every opportunity they have to impart God's truth to their children and their grandchildren. Now, spiritual instruction 
is a father's, a dad's responsibility. That's God's declaration from several passages of Scripture throughout the Bible. But spiritual instruction is also the responsibility of mothers and grandmothers. It may have been the Apostle Paul who led Timothy to faith in Jesus Christ, but it was mom and grandma who who prepared his heart with the truth of Scripture. See, moms typically spend much more time with their children than their fathers do, and so many of the golden opportunities for imparting spiritual truth fall when only mom is with the kids. And moms have the responsibility to take those opportunities and use them for their child's spiritual betterment or advancement. You'll notice that Paul describes Timothy's faith as sincere and that his mother Eunice and his grandmother Lois had that sincere faith as well. That Greek word uh, that we translate sincere is anupokretos. I probably pronounced that wrong. I'll ask Eva about my pronunciation later. But it means genuine, without hypocrisy. There's other descriptions of that word. And that is important. Because if we want our kids and our grandkids to successfully live for the Lord Jesus Christ, then we must believe what we are teaching them. Then we must live out what we are teaching them from the Word of God. And if we are teaching them God's truth, but we are not living it out or living out what we say we believe, then our kids are far more inclined to not accept the truth of God, even though it is the truth. Really, we're all inclined to think that way, are we not? For example, I'll just use a a pilot illustration. If an airplane pilot wants to take you up for a ride in his airplane, and he claims that he has a very safe airplane and he is a very safe pilot, but he won't fly unless he has a parachute strapped to his back, are you going to get in with him and have a ride with him? Probably not. Probably not. That pilot with that parachute strapped to his back isn't demonstrating a whole lot of confidence in his airplane or his piloting abilities. Well, faith in Christ is the greatest gift that we can give uh, uh, to anyone or to help to give to anyone, but especially to our kids, to our children. If we do nothing else for in our child's life, then point him or her toward the Savior, we will have done the most important thing. Their eternal destiny hangs on the fact of their need for a perfect Savior. God's inspired word is useful for more beyond our initial salvation, beyond the salvation of our children or our grandchildren's eternal word, eternal souls, I'm sorry. God's word guides us into the practical outworking of that salvation. And that's where verse 16 is involved, where scripture is inspired by God and it is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. Teaching, that's giving God's truth, helping people, helping children to understand the truth from God. Reproof means to expose or to convict. It's to show your kids what's right, what's wrong according to God's standards. Correction means to set straight again, to set upright again, to restore, to bring back. Training in righteousness, it's teaching how to live in a right relationship with our God. Here's an interesting bit of trivia. A fellow by the name of William Frederick Dunkel Jr. has pointed out that of the 69 kings of France, only three were really loved by their subjects and that these were the only ones who were reared by their mothers instead of by tutors or guardians. You see, moms can have a profound influence on the character of their children as they grow up. And even after their children are grown, mothers can still have a strong influence in the lives of their children. Similarly, grandmothers too can have a great influence in the lives of the grandchildren from the time they're toddlers and preschoolers right up into adulthood. One of my fondest memories that I have of my grandma Tykrip is sitting at her kitchen table, talking about the Lord Jesus, talking about heaven, talking about parts of Revelation. I was about 18 years old at that time. 
One of the best memories I have of my grandma and grandpa Bueller are of them coming up to my graduation at Nippon Bible College and spending time with me and other students in an early morning prayer meeting. Don't underestimate the influence that you can be for God in the lives of your children and grandchildren by showing that you're interested in their lives and in their spiritual well-being. So what's the end result of this teaching, reproving, correcting, training in righteousness that Paul talks about? Well, hopefully the end result is that your children and your grandchildren will become people of God, adequately equipped for every good work because they know the truth of Scripture. I suspect that for the majority of you listening this morning, as for me, your mother was a believer in Christ before you were. And I suspect that for many of you, your mother played a very important part in your spiritual journey. She may have led you to faith in Christ. She may have taught you to pray. She may have read you Bible stories at bedtime. She may have showed you what was right, what was wrong. She may have corrected you, I'm, I'm sure she did. She may have instructed you on how to live in a right relationship with Jesus. If that's the case for you, then you need to be thankful to God for his working through your mom or your grandmom. You also need to be thankful for your mom. And if she is living today, you need to let her know that you are grateful for the part that she played in caring for you, in raising you, and if that's the case, in bringing you into the family of God. But if your mom is not a believer in Christ, you should still be thankful for her care for you. You can still be thankful for all the good that she has done for you. And you may also be the very best one to let her know of God's great love for her. What greater thing could you do for your mom than to introduce her to the one who loves her more deeply than even a mother could? You know, some of you listening this morning need to forgive your mom. Moms aren't always perfect. Not every mother is a good mother. But with God's help, you can forgive her even if she doesn't ask for it. And in so doing, you can honor your mother and be obedient to God's call on your life to do just that, to give honor to your parents, to your mother. God calls his people to give honor to their parents, to respect them, to be grateful for the part they played in our lives. And that mindset needs to be a lifestyle, not just a one Sunday per year. If you can, I would encourage, maybe you've done it already this morning, you said thanks to your mom for the part that she played in your life. And if you are a mom, I would encourage you with the fact that God uses mothers very, very effectively for the spiritual well-being of their children, grandchildren, and even great-grandchildren. Be encouraged. It's a noble calling to have that much influence in the lives of other people. May God bless you this Mother's Day Sunday. Let's pray. Father, we come to you. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you that you love us greater even more than our own moms do. And that's hard for us to fathom, but you demonstrate it in the fact that you were willing to allow your son to go through a whole lot of suffering and pain so that we could be forgiven of our sin, so that we could spend eternity with you and fellowship with you. And we give you thanks for that. Lord, we thank you that you continue to work on us all through our lives, whether we're toddlers or whether we are teenagers or young adults, middle-aged, seniors, whatever. Lord, we thank you that you don't give up on us. Father, we would ask your help in honoring our parents as we should for your glory, for their good. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for listening. May God bless you this Mother's Day Sunday.